being in the last days, the enemy is at war with us. And with the enemy being at war with us, you know that his time is short. He knows that his time is short. But I'm going to start right here in Genesis 6, 4. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, after the flood, there were still giants. Not as prevalent as before the flood, but there were still giants after the flood. When the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, we have to understand there's so much history about all of this. There's many legends, the, all of your Greek mythology, Roman mythology, uh, Native American mythology, Aztecs, Mayan, all of their histories are all about these Nephilim. And it, also another word you want to know is the ref, Rephaim. That's the Hebrew word for these fallen ones, these fallen angels. And as we look at the rise of Antichrist, we have talked extensively about the rise of the spirit of Antichrist. And in case you're blind, it's all around us all the time, even right now. It's in every, it's in every portion of our culture. And people think, oh, that's crazy. Listen, you, the devil has gone, worked hard to blind the minds of God's people. And you and I need to have our eyes opened to what he wants us to see in these last days. It says in Revelation 13, 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him. That's the Antichrist. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we can see all of this is at stake. And we're going to be talking a lot about Mystery Babylon. That's the platform of the Antichrist, as we will see. And it's about control of the world, even right now. And even right now, we're moving into days where the enemy is wanting to take full control of planet Earth. We're looking at what they call a great reset that they're wanting to come up with right now. And it's all part of this and part and parcel of the mystery religions and they want you to become part of that. So beware of Babylon. Tonight we're going to be talking about the conspiratorial history after the flood. And of course, this is a picture of Nimrod and Semiramis. We're going to be talking about them a lot. But after the flood, the three sons of Noah went out. The red, this is Japheth's area where the sons of Japheth went and settled. This yellow here is where Shem and his uh, sons went, and the green part is where Ham went. Basically, the, this up here is where Araf, the Ararat is, where the uh, ark settled, and this is where they all went out to. It says in Genesis 10:5, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after the families in their nations. This is what they call the table of the nations. You'll find it in Genesis 10. And it gives you a good idea of who went where. There's a lot of names that you know in the Bible, like Magog. And there's a lot of names that you've heard. These are the sons of Japheth, Shem, and Ham. So the table of the nations is important to have your uh, eyes on. Now, it says in Genesis 10, 8, Cush, now the, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. That sounds like no big deal, doesn't it? In the way it's put out there in our language. But actually, there's a lot there that we need to unpack because he was an absolute total rebel. Cush was the son of Ham and started the greatest rebellion in the history of the world that still affects us to this day. Not only were there giants in the land, but they had supernatural knowledge given to them by these fallen angels that still affects planet Earth today. And we'll be talking about a lot of that. Remember, the lie of Satan, that you will be like gods. Remember that, Eve, what God has said? And he threw dispersion on God and said, God knows the day you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened. Well, that's what the devil's trying to do to human beings even now. He's wanting you to be 
hooked into the knowledge of good and evil, just like that tree had. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not wrong to know things, but there's a place where God wants you to know things, and there's a place where God wants to hold it back from you for your own good. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We want to be faithful to the Lord, do we not? The lust for knowledge. God, there's a lot of things that the Lord wants us to know, but imp more important than anything else is your faith in him to give you, as a loving father, what you need. But the very thing that we're running into right now in our culture is this idea, the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like gods and you'll know you'll be like gods. You will be like gods. That is one of the goals and the aspirations of the mystery religions is that you will stop being like a human being and become something else like God. You'll notice all the old religions, Pharaoh. What was Pharaoh? He was Ra. He was God. What, and you name it. It's called apotheosis when you turn from something, in, from a human being into something else. And look at the movies. Look at the cartoons your children are seeing. Look at the things we put before our eyes now. Are they not, in many, many cases, people wanting to become something other than what they are now. In fact, later on in our teachings on the, the rise of Antichrist, I'm going to be doing an update on transhumanism because it's amazing where this is going, and it's going fast there as well. And we're also going to do an update on ancient aliens and the alien invasion that is planned to coming to planet Earth. I believe will be the big deception that's talked about in the Bible, but that's later on down the road. But we have to understand these basic principles of the mystery religions because they're all over our culture, even right now, embedded in many of the religions as well. Those deceived by Satan's dark lies think much about how to achieve apotheosis. That's a term you should be familiar with. Apotheosis, becoming a superhuman. Remember the Nazis in Germany during World War II, they were hung up on the superman, the, uh, the, the, the ubermenschen, the superman, that they were better than everybody else because they had evolved into something. And that is why they, you know, they thought themselves better. A blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, person was of great noble birth and so forth, better than the others. Because the ascended masters, this is all the religions in the world pretty much represented. The, the spirit of Antichrist is all over this. Notice that they put Yeshua in as one of the ascended masters, Some peop, somebody that has a, attained godhood. He didn't attain godhood. He was God. He always was God. That's the point. But you see, this all comes from the Garden of Eden. You shall be like gods. These people who desire to bring about a new world order Look to Nimrod as the great example of how to be like God, having their eyes open to good and evil, what they consider good and evil. And it goes all of it back to Nimrod. Remember that Satan is the ultimate thief. The people that believe in this, they don't have salvation. They don't have eternity promised to them. What they have is a pack of lies. And what they have goes all the way back to the devil deceiving them. This is a book by Pastor Nafti, Nimrod, the first Antichrist. When you talk about the Antichrist, you must understand that the spirit of Nimrod and everything about Nimrod is the perfect model for who and what the Antichrist is going to be about. That's why we're approaching it from this angle. The ent this entire spiritual plan passed down through secret religious teachings, is traced to the time of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. That's where the mystery religions come from. And of course, we see today that people really believe in the Tower of Babel. They believe in the mystery religions. They've been steeped on it. You know, a lot of people that are believers in Yeshua, a lot of people that go to church, 
A lot of Messianic believers have no clue that this religion even exists out there. But it's all over the world. And now we're starting to see the scientific community start to play into the religious realm because their science in itself is a religion. And you're starting to see them look at these things like they have their doctrines and so forth. And the one thing that they want out of it is anybody that believes in the Bible. Many people believe that the amazing technology we're witnessing today is the same technology that was here before God wiped the earth with the flood of Noah. And I believe there's a lot of truth in that. The technology before the flood, we have no idea. But I don't believe that they were, these were cavemen, Neanderthals, scraping their knuckles as they walked. I don't think it was like that at all. Sir Francis Bacon, you may have heard of him. He was a, a, an Englishman. He wrote a book called The New Atlantis. He was a Luciferian. He wrote a book called The New Atlantis because he said the, the American colonies were to be the New Atlantis because Atlantis was the place where the watchers was. This was the utopian place before the flood where the watchers were. And from there, they controlled the world. And he thought that the New World Order was supposed to be in the American colonies. And from there, they were going to control the world. And that's been precisely the thought of, the Amer of when the United States became a nation. The people that founded it, the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians and the people that were in the secret societies that did this, they all had the thought that the New World Order was to stem from America. How is it that Nimrod, who was born thousands of years ago, could be a part of all of this? Who was he? What exactly was he? Nimrod was the most influential leader on earth in the period between the flood of Noah and Abraham. Now, let's look at some of where this has gone since Nimrod. Who is Nimrod? There's a, there's a fictitious character. It's the oldest writing known to mankind. It's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is very similar to the, to the Odyssey of Homer. And it's a fictitious story, but it talks about this, this giant man. Nimrod's widespread popularity is noted in the cities named in connection to him. Burst Nimrud, Tel Nimrud, near Baghdad, the, the Mound of Nimrud, ancient Kala, all these cities. He was a huge influence then. This is ancient Babylon, generally thought to be the site of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. This is in modern-day Iraq, right near Baghdad. This is Mosul, which is actually ancient Nineveh. And Nimrod started both Babylon and Nineveh. Not one, but two great cultures did he start. Now, being a mighty hunter that we read before not only revealed Nimrod's military might, but also his protectiveness in a time when wild animals were a continual menace. Remember, this is right after the flood. They let the animals off the ark, right? And in these ancient areas, the, the animals, they reproduced, and they were all over the place. Just as human beings started to come up, so did the lions and the tigers and so forth. And Nimrod was one who was known as a mighty hunter because he, the population, they would kill the, the jackals and the lions and the tigers. In addition, Nimrod was also the first to build fenced or fortified cities. Now here's a concept that we don't even think of very often. But it was Nimrod, and at Nimrod's behest, when people started to congregate into places that would be cities, huge cities. When God's plan was for us to be an agricultural sort and to go out everywhere. You see, the, the idea that we need to be around a bunch of people is really wasn't God's design to begin with at all. That went back to Nimrod. It goes back to mankind of trying to control man. So you have Nimrod. All Luciferian secret societies that embrace the Babylonian mystery religion esteem Nimrod as a great person. 
However, they revere Nimrod more as a god. He was somebody that they believe attained godhood. And many of your other uh, cousins of, in cultures like in Egypt and Greece and so forth, and in Rome later, they all believe that their emperors and their kings also attained godhood. All your secret societies today believe this. So you don't want to join a secret society because you have to ask yourself, why are you a secret society? What do you have to hide? One thing about the gospel is we shout it from the housetop. We hide nothing. We live in the light. We don't live in darkness. The very fact that you've got to keep what you believe secret should tell you something. These are some of the, this is Freemasonry, the G's. They'll tell you it stands for different things. Some people say Gnosticism, because that does start with a G. Uh, the uh, great architect of the universe. And they have different things that they'll tell you the G stands for. Some believe it stands for God. By the way, the God in God we trust on your money, that's not talking about the God of the Bible. It's a very generic term when you say God. Who's God? Which God? To the Freemasons who put the money together, it's not Yahweh. It's not the God of the Bible at all. It's their God, the Luciferian God, the God of the one, the all-seeing eye. Theosophy, which came into real popularity back in the 1800s. The history of the Rosicrucians, which is means the rosy cross it's a secret society it's the world's most mysterious secret society rosicrucian kabbalah kabbalah is flat out of the occult people say well it's it's just you don't understand it because it's jewish no i understand enough of it and i understand it's of the occult it's of the devil doesn't matter what culture you're from however a minute study of Nimrod's life, deeds, thoughts reveal his virtue to be quite the opposite of what his followers kind of commonly accept. They think he's such a wonderful guy. Fact is, the word mighty, gibor, means he was a warrior, a tyrant. A tyrant is one who exercises power in a harsh and cruel manner. That was who Nimrod was. And that's who we're looking at. The spirit of Nimrod today controls much of the world, and much of the world doesn't even realize it. So he's known in history as a hunter of men. And he was the, the latter part of the phrase says, before the Lord, stems around from the word before, which comes from the Hebrew word panim, meaning the face, as the part of the face that turns. In other words, transitioning from the description in Hebrew, that is, turns away from the Lord or rebels against the Lord. The whole concept is he rebelled against Yahweh the God of the Bible, and he was, the, being a mighty hunter, he used all of his influence to turn people away from the God of the Bible. He was a complete rebel. And we see this in everything that he has said and done, and all the mystery religions hate the God of the Bible. I've known Freemasons, they'll say, yeah, I believe in the Bible, and, I'll, and I know there's a lot of Freemasons that are in Christian ministries. I don't know how you can say you're a follower of Yeshua, be a pastor of a church, and be a Freemason. But there are, there's many of them out there. It's a contradiction in terms, completely. Therefore, the scriptures reveal to us that Nimrod was a tyrant who openly turned his face from the Lord. This is why he's still referred to in the Hebrew Bible as the rebel or the rebellious one. And even today, these religions are very much alive. Have you ever heard of Bohemian Grove? Bohemian Grove is a place north of San Francisco where all of our leaders of our country and many other countries, and in the entertainment field, and in politics, and people of any kind of esteem at all go there so that they can worship in this grove that is dedicated to, I believe it's Molech, the, the heathen, he, heathen deity, and they go there every year. It's a drunken orgy of a time, and it's annual. Lastly, and most importantly, Nimrod became somehow a hybrid being. 
something other than a human. Part human and part angelic, a gibor, a giant, or a Nephilim. This is after the flood. Keep in mind, it, it wasn't just that the fallen angels, the watchers, turned, had, mated with women and they were giants. That was part of it. But they also gave them secret knowledge of how to do things. And one of the things that they were able to do, and you see this in many of the, in, in voodoo and, and some of the uh, really uh, far out of, of things that, of witchcraft that are out there, they learned how to change the human genome into something else. And I, when you give yourself over to the devil and you play around with the things of the devil, things happen. And just because you think you saw a miracle doesn't mean the miracles of God. You have to understand. Do you remember in uh, Genesis when Moses threw down his staff before Pharaoh? Remember? And... What is that? <laughs> is it the microwave? Oh, hey. Okay, the french fries are done. Okay. But you remember Moses threw his staff down before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's like, no big deal. Jannies, John Breeds, come over here. They threw their staffs down. And they too turned into serpents, except Moses' serpent ate theirs up. But notice that they, had, they were in touch with the supernatural realm. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about Nimrod. And they believe it. It says in Genesis 6, 4 again, There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So, when you read and you study the different cultures around us, you find that they all have their stories and their legends about giants. In fact, there's, there's legends now, even during World War II, out in the Pacific. Japanese soldiers and American soldiers both will tell you there was certain islands out there that they went to that there were giants on those islands. During the Iraqi War, there's a famous incident where there was a giant in a cave and the American soldiers came and they killed him, but they, they secretly carted him off so nobody could fi find out. There's amazing stories about these things that are still all over the globe even today. And it goes back to Nimrod. Therefore, Bible narrative, although somewhat obscure, develops this very prominent and notorious character who ruled in the years after the great flood, and his name was Nimrod. Again, he was the sixth son born of Cush, the grandson of Noah. And remember, his name in Hebrew means to rebel. He was a pure rebel before the Lord. And the secret knowledge that they have, it's all over their belief system, and it's, their secret societies all have the things. They think that because they know things that they'll have salvation somehow. You're not saved by what you know. You're saved by the blood of Yeshua, period. And Nimrod was the founder of both Babylon and Assyria. The mighty hunter before the Lord was a total enemy to Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and he loathed everything to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why you, it, you come to Babylon and Ashur, where you get the name of Assyria, this entire area, the land of Shinar, is where they built the Tower of Babel. And you have to understand that this was a complete rebellion against what God wanted. And that's what the Tower of Babel was all about. And it's amazing what God said. He said, God, it says, God came down in Genesis 11. He saw what men were doing, and he said, because their imaginations, they could do anything they wanted to do, that is when God confused the languages. Nimrod was tyrannical, was wicked, and caused the whole world to rebel through the building of the Tower of Babel. And it said in Genesis 11, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. 
Notice they're just trying to hold everybody together. The Lord wanted to scatter everybody. Notice also that they wanted to make a name for themselves. Where's that pride come from? You want to know a couple interesting things? You know, when you go into any major city, aren't you always astounded at how tall the buildings are? Where does that idea come from? Where does that thought come from? To build buildings so high and so tall. It goes all the way back to the tower. P people trying to make a name for themselves. The very thought, the very pride. King Nimrod was the first to establish kingdoms. And in his case, it happened in two stages. The first kingdom was in Shinar, which included Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne. And the second was Ashur. Now, because of the confusion of the languages, Nimrod, his name became different in every culture that you can imagine. Other names for Nimrod, Gilgamesh, Baal, Melkort, Adonis, Eshman, Damuzi, Dionysius, Bacchus, Orion, Marduk, Mithra, Manurta, Apollo, Ra, Osiris. All of them are Nimrod in their cultures. Remember, the names were changed, but the personage stays about the same. The second kingdom again was Assyria. <clears throat> and it says, this is from the prophet Micah. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod and its entrances. He shall deliver us from the Assyrian. Now the Assyrian is associated with the Antichrist. One of the, when we study who the Antichrist is going to be, one of his names is the Assyrian. That's why a lot of people believe that the Antichrist is going to come out of that general area of where Assyria is. When he comes into our land, so it goes all back, all the way back, but I want you to know that everything that I'm talking to you about Nimrod is coming back in our culture even right now because these secret societies have planned for the day we're living in right now. How many of you realize that it was December 21st, 2020? How many of you are aware that that in the occult was known as the dawning of the age of Aquarius? That's what they had planned. Of course... I didn't hear anything about it until I started studying this stuff back. But I have to tell you, they believe what is out there. And it all goes back to Nimrod. Now, after the language was separated, divided, and confused by God, it drove Nimrod to Assyria from Babylon. And the two, Assyria and Babylon, have been intertwined since then. Everything about them are intertwined. <clears throat> so you have the confusion of the languages. Can you imagine being there that day that all of a sudden... I couldn't communicate with Bill anymore because he's now speaking German or something. And it's like, what's wrong with you? And he can't understand what I'm saying at all because he doesn't understand English. But this is where it all happened, right here in the area of Babylon, ancient Mesopotamia. By the way, the name Mesopotamia means the land between two rivers. Josephus says, the, the historian. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah. He was a bold man and of great strength of hand. And remember, Ham, Ham was, his son Canaan was cursed by God. Remember that. And this is Canaan land right there, which ended up being the land promised to Abraham. But you see, it all is related together. Now, Nimrod persuaded people to ascribe to the esoteric knowledge given by the watchers to mankind before the flood. So sacred and secretive knowledge in almost every field caused man to turn from God, the God of Noah, to the supernatural rebellious religious system. This is what we're dealing with. This mystery Babylonian mystery religion that Nimrod put in place is what we're dealing with. So that's Nimrod. He gradually changed the normal government into a tyrannical dictatorship, turning men from the fear of God to the fear of Nimrod. They are taught to have a continual dependence on Nimrod's power. That was from Josephus. And this is, so now we're looking at the New World Order, and you've got the background now, and we're going to be looking at some of the things. 
I'm sure as we start to look at some of these various aspects of it, it's going to click into your mind some things that you have seen in your life that you wondered where it, why it was like that. Now you're going to see how it got to be that way. The Tower of Babel was, in, en in essence, an attempt of rebellious man to have his own way apart from God. They threw off God. And now we're looking at, we're living in the days where the destruction of Mystery Babylon is pretty close at hand, I believe. As we look at the New World Order, humans were commanded by God to be fruitful and fill the earth. It's going to be like that. When Yeshua comes back, you're going to see this played out. Instead, they attempted to settle down in one location and establish a world state to offset the divine rule. Did you ever notice when the communists took over China? They took away a lot of their power to do anything on their own, and everything had to come from the government. That's the very spirit of Nimrod. The tower was a blatant attempt to break the yoke of Yahweh's divine order and rule. Nimrod intended to take God's place. You look in a communist government. Who do they look at as God? They say they don't believe in God, but yet they'll carry big pictures of, of Kim in Korea or uh, Gorbachev or whoever in, in the Soviet Union. You know, They have to have somebody that they revere as a god. Communism isn't atheist. It's just a false god. It's a different way to worship a false god. The, the communism is based upon, we're going to look at in a couple weeks, communism was brought out of Freemasonry. So Nimrod, the creator of the cities of men. And the cultic background now. Tradition suggests that Nimrod died a violent death. You can't say he didn't deserve it. One tradition says that a wild animal killed him. Another says that Shem, Noah's son, killed him because he had led the people into the worship of Baal, the sun god. So we're looking at Shem. Really? You start to read, you go, really? That's kind of an odd thing. But it's in almost every culture, something very similar. We'll look at this, too. So Nimrod died a violent death. According to ancient Egyptian and Babylonian traditions, remember, you're just changing the names, but a lot of times the story's the same. Nimrod's wife was Semiramis, and Semiramis was also Nimrod's mother. So I'll give you a second here to say, how can, wait a minute, Semiramis was his wife and his mother? You're getting into the complexities here of the mother-child goddess worship here. And you have to understand that this runs very deep in our culture, especially if you came out of a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox background. This is because after Nimrod's death, she bore a son, Tammuz, whom she declared to be the resurrected Nimrod. So it was, it's the confusion, I think, is pretty much on purpose. They wanted to obscure who Nimrod actually was with Tammuz. But notice that you've got a fake trinity even going on here with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, and back and forth and so forth. So you have Semiramis. Notice the imagery. The crescent moon. I can think of things like Islam. You've got the five-pointed star. None of it is by accident. Nimrod is also known as Baal, the sun god. You have Tammuz. Semiramis was the moon goddess of ancient Babylon, the wife and mother of Nimrod. Nimrod and Tammuz were supposed to be born on December the 25th. This is why Semiramis is sometimes referred to as the mother of Nimrod and sometimes as his wife. Of course, this also led to the belief that Nimrod married his mother. Makes sense to me. Not really. See, so have the picture of the statue of Semiramis. This is in Rome, I believe, the statues. Then you have the statue of the young child, Tammuz. Additionally, according to these traditions, Semiramis, who rose to greatness because of her son, Tammuz, was presented with a difficulty when Tammuz also died. Oh, by the way, there's Semiramis. Her, her name was the Queen of Heaven. 
the mother of God. Notice that interchangeably you have Semiramis, now you got Nimrod who's the child. It's all very plain, isn't it? Not really. But look, the mother and wife of Nimrod, or Baal, she was called Ishtar, pronounced Easter, Esther, Esther in English, Astarte, Ashtaroth, and Isis in Egypt, and now Mary in the Catholic Church. But notice all the symbolism. Very similar. And it's all over our culture. You can't even go to Starbucks without seeing this symbolism. The Statue of Liberty is based on it. Columbia. All over the place. So you have this trinity of Semiramis. Notice how sexual the stuff is. Everything that comes out of the mystery religion is very sexual, very lustful. Nimrod, Tammuz, it's all there. Nimrod had been proclaimed to be a god. Now Semiramis declared Tammuz to also be a god, and she declared herself to be a goddess. It's a lot of power, isn't it? But you see, it's all over the place, the symbolism of who Semiramis actually was, given different names as well. The Statue of Liberty, for example, is known, this is the goddess Liber, uh, Libertas, which you think, oh, liberty, that's so nice. No, Libertas is the, is the lustful spirit of anything goes. Libertas, We're for, as it's in the occult, it's do as thou wilt. Do whatever it is you feel like doing. That's Libertas. And every one of these has a story behind it. One legend states that after Nimrod was killed, Semiramis claimed that an evergreen tree sprouted from a tree stump. Semiramis declared that this indicated the entry of new life into the deceased Nimrod. She's proclaiming this stuff. Well, that's where you get the Baal and Asherah poles. The tree is actually meant as a phallic symbol, and the wreath is meant as a womb in ancient Babylon. That's where that comes from. Therefore, every year on the anniversary of Nimrod's birth, December 25th, they were to leave gifts at this evergreen tree. <laughs> that's, that's your basic Babylonian religion. Christmas. And remember what it says in Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the way of the nations, for the customs of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest, they adorn it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with a hammer and nails. What could it be talking about? So this is where we ended last time, but now we're going to go into a bit deeper here for our sake, for our Friday night. <coughs> Semiramis, therefore, is the queen of heaven and the mother of harlots. Even though Semiramis claimed to be a virgin, she had her son Tammuz, who she said was the reincarnation of Nimrod. And you see all this imagery in the different cultures. In India, Tammuz is Krishna, and her name is Devaki. In Egypt, she's Isis, and he's Horus. Samaramis and Tammuz, Maria, and Jesus. Notice, you see the, the halos? That is all Baal worship. That is supposed to be a sunburst. That goes back to worshiping the sun. Whenever you see during the Enlightenment, the halo and all of the art that you've seen over the years, that goes back to the sun god. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what religion that is. Quan Yin and Yin, Sheng Mu, probably China. But notice, notice the sun, even in the, oh, those Asian cultures. She became known as the Virgin Mother, Holy Mother, and the Queen of Heaven. And this was all symbolized by the moon. That's what the moon is supposed to represent, is her, her virginity. Mother goddess worship, which is pagan. In Egypt, again, she's Isis, and the sun is Horus. This is where all the, all the conflict, people that are Roman Catholic, they have no concept of this at all. But almost everything in Roman Catholicism comes out of Babylon. The Babylonian origins of Easter. Easter is Ishtar, goddess of fertility. The rabbit is a has to do with fertility remember rabbits reproduce real fast don't they 
Easter eggs. goes back to worship of the sun. The yoke is yellow like the sun. Symbols also of fertility. Thus began the worship of Semiramis and the child god Tammuz, the reincarnated Nimrod. This is the Babylonian mystery religion with all its paraphernalia shaking their fist of Lucifer at the true creator of the universe. It's what it is. It's not just another god, it's the enemy of our god. And mystery Babylon is a seductress that comes after the spirit of Semiramis and Nimrod and the mystery religions. They're all very sexual. They're all very uh, uh, inviting to people that don't know better. So from many ancient sources, it appears that Nimrod's wife, mother, Semiramis, was high priestess and goddess of the Babel religion and the founder of all mystery religions opposing the God of the Bible. And again, you see all the symmetry, all of it. It's all there. And it's all over our culture, by the way. Hopefully now you're going to see it everywhere you go because it's everywhere you go. So after the Tower of Babel was destroyed, and the many languages appeared, Semiramis was worshipped as a goddess under many different names. So these are some of the names in different cultures. Nimrod was known as Baal, El, Belus, Ninus, Zeus, Jupiter, Ra, Vishnu, Panku, Teotl, Odin. No matter where you go, Semiramis, the queen of heaven, Ashtaroth, Astart, Rhea, Ishtar, Belthus, Aphrodite, Sibyl, Diana, Isis, Hathor, Isi, Devaki, Hingo, Matsupu, Koalitku, Friga, Freda, whatever. Tammuz, Bacchus, Tammuz, Hercules. All these names that we're familiar with, a lot of them are in our cartoons. A lot of them are in the movies we see. Krishna, all of them, it's all there. And it all stems back to, and it goes back to what happened at Babel. Semiramis became Ishtar of Syria, Astarte of Phoenicia, Isis of Egypt, Aphrodite of Greece, and Venus of Rome, etc., 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 all the way down the line. And all goes back to Babylon. So Babylonian religion has a very outwardly exotic, sexual, incestual, lustful spirit attached to it. Just think about it. Do you think you're Roman Catholic priests? Do you think they started out as Roman Catholic priests saying, you know what, I want to get into pedophilia. You know what, I want to get into little boys or little girls. Do you think they started out that way? No. The spirit of this pulls upon you and drags you and draws you in. That is why you even see in many Protestant churches pastors sexually falling it's because the spirit of this lust is pulling and drawing on you all the time that if you're not aware of this, if you're not sober and vigilant, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is going to eat you up. Semiramis' son, Tammuz, also came. Now, one of the months of the Hebrew year, if you, in case you haven't noticed, is the month of Tammuz. So it's had its big effect on Judaism as well as Christianity. Her son Tammuz also came to be deified under various names and was the consort of Ishtar, the god of the underworld. Remember the story of the Watchers. All of this that happens with Nimrod goes all the way back to the Watchers before the flood because they venerate the Watchers. They honor the Watchers. They want to be in touch with the Watchers. Nimrod communicating with the fallen spirits is exactly what was going on in his life. The harlot Babylon. Babylon the Great in Revelation 17. We'll, we'll revisit this later on in our, our series on the Antichrist because this goes all the way through to the book of Revelation. According to the cult of Ishtar, Tammuz was conceived by a sunbeam, a counterfeit version of Yeshua's virgin birth. Notice how there's a lot of parallels between what's in the Bible and all these ancient traditions. That's because the devil and our Lord are at war. Tammuz corresponded to Baal, the sun god in Phoenicia, Osiris in Egypt, Eros in Greece, and Cupid in Rome. Eros, by the way, this is where we get the word erotic in English. 
the forgotten God that the world still worships is Tammuz. In every case, the worship of these gods and goddesses is associated with sexual immorality. It's a very strong, lustful spirit. As I said before, a lot of the things you see, you know, we'll all stand before God for our lives. Amen? But understand that when you're involved with something that is spiritually over your head, you're going to pay a price. Because you're being pulled into something, you don't realize how powerful it really is. All the, all the things that we have going on in the churches today, you can take it all back in one way, shape, or form to Babylon and the mystery religions, even homosexual sexuality that's in the church today. You can take that spirit all the way back because it's been there. The celebration of Lent. How many of you have heard of Lent? The celebration of Lent, which has no basis in Scripture, is instead rooted in the pagan celebration of Semiramis's mourning for 40 days over the death of her husband, son, Tammuz, before his alleged resurrection. Remember, all about the fertility gods. This is Ishtar, pronounced Easter. Easter was originally the celebration of Ishtar, the Assyrian and Babylonian goddess of fertility and sex. Her symbols, like the egg and the bunny, were and still are fertility and sex symbols, or did you actually think eggs and bunnies had anything to do with the resurrection? After Constantine decided to Christianize the empire, Easter was changed to represent Jesus, but at its roots, it's all about the celebration, fertility, and sex. And we see this all over, even now, all throughout history. This is what has been celebrated. This is Pan. The grotto of Pan is at Caesarea Philippi, where Yeshua went up on the uh, uh, Mount Hermon. Pan is the Greek god of nature and fertility. He has the legs and feet and horns of a goat and torso, arms, and head of a man. He's often pictured with his flute, dancing, laughing, and leering suggestively. The embodiment of sexual energy, Pan reminds us to focus on the pleasures of now. He can help keep, his, keep us connected with the wild places within ourselves. That's people that are into this are very much into it. And you see how wild things are in our culture today. They have help by the spirit of the devil. You think porn is just something that just kind of happened in our culture? It's a spirit behind pornography. A person is actually tapping into the demonic realm by actively participating in an industry that is controlled by Satan. And this especially is dangerous because especially men, men going to church and synagogue, men and women who think they're right, everything's right before God, all of a sudden there's this pull upon them when they get on their computer looking at porn. And the more they, they look at it, the harder it is to get away from it. That's a demonic hold. That's a stronghold that everybody needs to watch out for. But it is there pulling at those who allow themselves to be pulled. Pornography brings a person under the influence and even control of the demonic entities that control it. You don't think the devil's out there doing his job? We must be sober. We must be vigilant. Because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. Lent. Back to Lent here. The Babylon, Babylon tradition. The 40 days of Lent symbolizes the 40 years that Tammuz lived. Lent ends with Easter when it is the tradition to eat ham. This symbolizes the remembrance of Tammuz who was killed by a wild boar. That's why you eat ham on Easter Sunday is because Tammuz was killed by a wild boar. Forty days. He represents his 40 years. I'm sorry, Bill. You, you want to get that? Now, so the paganism of Lent and the weeping of Tammuz. This is in the Bible, the weeping for Tammuz. The Babylonian mystery religion is an age-old cult belief system and is simply another of Satan's mythical counterfeits meant to deceive humankind. It's driven by Satan. 
It's enjoined by the spirit of Nimrod and the spirit of Antichrist and is an attraction for every demonic spirit given the freedom to approach. We're in a spiritual war. You have to understand that these things are very real and the devil is going about trying to devour our entire culture. We must be on our toes. Yes, these demonic spirits, these satanic mythical counterfeits have been so widespread that people over the centuries have assumed them to be no problem. And they, in the church, do you think they're talking about this stuff in churches? They embody the occult, hidden mystery beliefs, and are still followed in much of Judaism and Christianity even today. The mystery of lawlessness and or the mystery of iniquity is spoken of in Scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2. It says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is what we're witnessing. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. And, he, and through lawlessness and iniquity, you're going to chase the, the presence of God right out of your midst if you fall into these things. So we must be careful to keep our eyes on Yeshua. Amen? It says in Scripture, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. That's Babylon. The name Babylon means confusion. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people. It's a war. It's a blood war. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. It's exactly what's happening around us even right now. With all their symbolism. Don't get hung up on symbols. Like everybody says, oh, it's the cross. They must be good people. The cross has been misused and, mis and misnamed in many places. Be careful. The enemy does, is not threatened by a symbol. He's threatened by the word of God. Ezekiel 8, 12 through 15. Then he said to me, this, now Ezekiel is taken from Babylon back to Jerusalem by the hair of an angel, takes him by the hair and takes him to the temple in Jerusalem. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols? For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Remember, they were in exile at this point. So this, remember all the symbols we've been talking about, the sunburst, the sun worship, on and on and on. And he said to me, Turn again, and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. You see, getting back to all of this, we, we think, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, December 25th is Nimrod's birthday. It's, yeah. I've been in churches where they've had Christmas trees on the stage. I remember one time I got in trouble with my family because the pastor got up there and he's, he's, he had this huge Christmas tree up there. And, and he says, what does this Christmas tree represent to you? And I go, paganism. <laughs> and, and my fam, all my kids are going, oh, God. <laughs> then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? This is the Lord saying to Ezekiel, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. And we see this all over the place. Idolatry in the house of God. We see it everywhere on our culture. We see your brothers and my brothers and sisters out there totally ignorant of these subjects. We need to be the ones that know these things. And so we get down to, who is the Antichrist? A lot of people want to you know, get real flippant. Well, who's the Antichrist? The spirit of Antichrist, we're up, to, we're up to here with the spirit of Antichrist all around us all the time. There will be the coming of the man of sin. But right now, the spirit of the Antichrist is choking out the people of God, and we must wake up to this stuff. Ezekiel is communicating, is communing with the Lord in a vision. And the Lord shows him these things. He said, look closely at what the Lord was offended at. What, what offended God here? What was, what was he especially incensed at? 
the Babylonians took Ezekiel to Babylon in the second invasion of Nebuchadnezzar in 597 B.C. Before that, their main invasion occurred in 586 B.C. They came in several trips. But now the children of God were worshiping idols. They were worshiping things that weren't God, had nothing to do with God. Ezekiel's trying to look at it and figure out, God's telling them. Now sometime after this second invasion and before the third invasion, the Lord showed Ezekiel the extent of the apostasy of the Jews back in Jerusalem. So God wanted Ezekiel to see the apostasy. They had left worship of the Lord God of the Bible, and they had fallen into idolatry, worshiping other things, even in the most painful exile you can imagine. It says in Deuteronomy, When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. It's our responsibility not to fall into this stuff. Yes, it's easy to fall into the traps around us, isn't it? But Yeshua said, do not be deceived. It's up to you and me not to be deceived. There's no excuse for falling into this, this apostasy, these abominations. Just because we grew up with it is no excuse before the Lord, because the Lord is there to be known. In Jerusalem, the Jews worshipped Isis and her son Osiris, otherwise known as Horus. The same mother and child deities appeared in Greece as Cirrus, the great mother, and the babe at her breast, or as Irene, the goddess of peace, with the boy Plutus in her arms, and in pagan Rome as Fortuna and Jupiter, etc., 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 on and on and on. Ezekiel 8:16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. They're at the temple of God, and they're worshipping the sun at God's temple. What an abomination. You know, we read in, this, in the book of Revelation where Yeshua was going to say, or not in the book of Matthew, I'm sorry. Depart from me, you cursed, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Here they're at the temple of, they're, they're God's house, and they're facing east to worship the sun, S-U-N. You shall have no other gods before me. It's very basic, isn't it? Now there's, look at the fire of his jealousy. God's judgment at the Tower of Babel frustrated their primary purpose of making a grand demonstration of humanistic unity without the Lord, okay? And we see this today. They want to have their religion without Yeshua, without the Lord, without God. They want their God, Lucifer. Now, by confusing their language, that they may not understand one another's speech, and scattering them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, the Lord halted the building of the tower and fractured their solidarity. Amen? They could no longer communicate. Of course, today, we see them coming together. However, those people took with them the seeds of their false, idolatrous religion, seeds that they and their descendants have been planting throughout the earth, even now. And they're... They can communicate with each other now, but they're still serving the same false God. It says in Daniel 12, 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Where will you be? I want to I wanna awake to everlasting life, and you do that by following Yeshua. Everything else will lead you to everlasting contempt. Everything else. Then in Daniel 3, the next verse. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Glory to God. So, Satan's real plans. Remember, we talked about the symbols, right? One world religion. By the way, um, uh, just, uh, just a new discovery to me. I, it's an old one, but beware of Chrislam. 
Christianity and Islam have nothing in common. There's Yeshua and there's every other false religion. We'll get into this more as we, the days ahead come upon us. So ever since the ideas and some forms from Mystery Babylon may have been altered, adapted, and sometimes made more sophisticated, but their basic system remained and remains unchanged and unchecked, goes back to Nimrod even today. That is why Babel or Babylon is called the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. She's been the forerunner and progenitor of all false religions in history. Every one. Mystery Babylon. Mother of harlots. Very seductive, but the abominations of the earth. Amen? So let's pray. Father, in Yeshua's name, we love you and we praise you. Lord, open our eyes to what you want us to see and open our hearts to you. For it is you we live and move and have our being. And we thank you, Lord, for your revelation.